So, um, well, welcome, Andrea, and everyone else. Uh, and well, good afternoon, good or, or in your case, good evening. Um, and maybe some people, for some people, it might be good morning. Um, well, thanks for all for joining us for the first talk in the Spaces of Containment and Care speaker series. Um, in this series, we're going to be reflecting on and thinking about the spatial politics as well as the architectural configurations of infectious diseases and health. Um, my name is Nida Rahman. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an assistant professor at the School of Architecture at CMU, and the series is supported by the CMU Center for Arts and Society, where I'm currently directing a project under these themes or, or on these themes through a three-year initiative called Borderlines. Um, I'll, at the end of my introduction, I'll put the link to the project in the chat um, and I would love it if anyone who's interested um, in any of the other talks or has questions about the project please do get in touch. Um, as most of you know there's a long history of landscapes and built environments being configured um, both as lenses for gauging human health um, and also of architecture and planning and spatial planning being utilized as tools to prevent transmission and infection. And of course, over the past year, we've become very accustomed to some of these uh, mechanisms of containment, quarantine and control, um, and, and especially the ways in which they are, you know, we seek to use them to disentangle human lives and pathogenic agents. So as some of the speakers in this series will discuss, many of these mechanisms also build on or reinforce processes of exclusion or injustice or othering um, and can advance forms of colonial or capitalist expansion territorialization. But at the same time, we can also think of how experiences of disease bring into view um, practices of care, practices of solidarity, of um, sort of community formation or reformation. Um, so to kick off this conversation, I'm really delighted to introduce Andrea Bagnato, who joins us from Italy. Uh, Andrea is very much an interdisciplinary scholar and researcher. He is an architect, and he studied at the Center for Research, Architecture, and Goldsmiths. He's also a professional book editor, and he's worked also with the Sharjah Architecture Triennale, with Forensic Architecture, um, and the Chicago Architecture Biennale. Some of the books he's worked on include Forensis, SQM, The Quantified Home, um, and A Moving Border, Alpine Cartographies of Climate Change. He's also been teaching history and theory of architecture at the Piet Institute in Rotterdam and at the Architecture Association in London. And Andrea has been thinking about the relationships of architecture and disease um, for some time as well. His long-term project, Terra Infecta, which was the recipient of a research award from the Graham Foundation in 2017, and also supported by the New Institute in Rotterdam, looks at the, what he calls the contradictory relationships between microbes and modernity, or how infectious diseases have shaped and been shaped by landscapes, built environments, and processes of urbanization. And the project has a lot of very interesting strands from the ecologies of malaria eradication in Italy, which he's gonna be talking about today, to the colonial history of HIV in the rubber plantations in the Congo basin. Um, and this work has been published in EFLUX Architecture, AA Files, the Journal of the Canadian Center for Architecture, um, and, and, and other venues as well. And it's also going to be the subject, I believe, of an upcoming book and an upcoming exhibition. So before, um, I pass it on to Andrea. I just want to let everyone know that there'll be time for questions um, and discussion after the talk. So please feel free also to use the chat function even during the, 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 the talk to add your questions. And then afterwards, please feel free um, to engage in the discussion. We're recording the talk. Um, for now, we're not going to necessarily make it public, uh, but uh, at some point in the due future, in, the, in due course, um, it might be put up as well. So with that, please join me uh, virtually um, in welcoming Andrea Bagnato. Thank you. And uh, Andrea, please feel free to um, share your screen. Um, I think you should be able to do that. <laughs> 
Yes, yes, I will. So thanks, Nida, really, for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really, I'm really pleased to, to be here. Um, I think the series is absolutely uh, relevant and important. Uh, and as I was saying before, my my um, inter intervention today might probably uh, sound fairly historical compared to um, to the others that are going to be in the series. I think that the project has uh, fairly um, substantial contemporary ramifications as well, which is also what I'm working on in other parts of, let's say, my practice. Uh, but today I thought it best to actually focus on the on the historical uh, part, which is really also the one that is the best developed in terms of uh, materials, documents, and fieldwork. Um, so yes, I will start to share my screen. Um, Do you see it? Yes. And now, yes. Great. Um, yes. So, as Nida was uh, saying in her kind of introduction, um, I have been working on, on this subject since uh, a couple of years, really, since uh, 2013, uh, 2014. Um, there, in fact, is a broad project and it's actually quite formless as well. It, it takes multiple shapes and it, it has looked at different uh, case studies and different uh, sites around the world and different questions. But really it began from the um, history of malaria and specifically the history of malaria in Southern Italy. Um, I started this project as a graduate student at, uh, sorry, as a, I think you, as a master's student. Um, um, different uh, me meaning in English and uh, British and U US English. As a master's student at Goldsmiths, and my key concern was to understand the impact of ideas of hygiene and sanitation onto the landscape. Uh, I thought that at the time it was a fairly underexplored and under theorized um, scale. Uh, on the one hand, you know, we know fairly well, we knew fairly well histories of sanitation and their impact uh, on architecture and on the shape of Western cities in particular. Uh, we knew, we know far less on the, on the impact of disease control on landscape and territory. And so I, I thought that the history of malaria and the Mediterranean is actually quite apt for this because, um, it's really a disease, malaria is really a disease, as you probably will know from Nida's research as well, that, that unfolds uh, over landscape and it has a, a very strong connection to, to the landscape because of course it's related to, to the order of water, to the way that water uh, functions on the landscape. So I'm going to talk about the main site of analysis that, that, that I've picked, which is uh, Western Sardinia. Um, so Sardinia, as you probably know, is uh, one of the largest islands on the Mediterranean. It's also fairly uh, isolated uh, in a way because it's quite far away from, from coastline. So it was, it was very isolated until the second part of the 20th century. Uh, it was hard to reach. It took like several days of navigation from kind of any part of continental Europe. Uh, so it also remains associated to this idea of remoteness, which is of course now deployed for, for tourist purposes. Um, Sardinia was also one of the regions of Italy that had the highest mortality rates for malaria in the early 20th century. Uh, the, 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 the mortality rates were comparable to those of Sub-Saharan Africa in the past 10 years, just to give you a sense of the, of the scale that the thing malaria, sorry, Malaria, the problem of malaria had in, 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 in southern Italy and in Sardinia in particular. Um, I'm going to start backwards actually. So to start from the end, uh, I think it's it's quite um, it's quite an important point, which is the history of uh, DDT usage, uh, of which Sardinia was a particular, uh, let's say, character. Uh, in, in this story. So I don't know how familiar you are with, with the history of DDT and the use of DDT as a disease control agent. Um, so it was, uh, DDT is a chemical compound that uh, was 
discovered in the late 19th century by a Swiss chemist. And it was, it sat on a shelf for about half a century because no one knew what to do with it. And then in, during the war, uh, the US army uh, was undertaking research uh, about possible insecticides that could help um, uh, American troops that were uh, posted in uh, tropical countries that were struggling with malaria. And they found that DDT was a particularly effective insecticide in, uh, in uh, killing uh, Anopheles mosquitoes. The Rockefeller Foundation was involved from the beginning in the, in the scientific research and, and especially in the way that DDT could be applied and deployed on a large scale. So after they, they found out about its effect, effectiveness, they set out to undertake a massive program of uh, experimentation to see whether DDT was really effective, would be really effective in eradicating malaria from parts of the world. So the Rockefeller Foundation was in charge of this with funding uh, from the US government as well. And they did several experiments around the world in Brazil um, and in Mexico, but then they settled on Italy because of course Italy was also um, theater of, of operations for, for the US army. And after several small experiments, they, they thought that Sardinia could be an ideal place to, to test malaria eradication on a regional scale. Because as I said before, it's an island, it, it's fairly remote and it's also very large for being an island. So it, it seemed like a perfect kind of open air laboratory. And so the so-called Sardinian project was started in 1946. So right after the war with funding from the reconstruction, uh, let's say US funds like the Marshall Plan and so on. Um, between 1946 and 1948, the entire surface of Sardinia was pretty much covered in DDT. You know, like every body of water, every house, every building was sprayed with DDT uh, in, with the objective of er completely eradicating the Anopheles mosquitoes from the island. So not just getting, rid, getting the island rid of malaria, but eliminating an entire species. This is the um, bunker, the World War II era bunker where the DDT uh, stores were kept. This is in Southern Sardinia, in city of uh, No one knows about this kind of story in Sardinia. I mean, the broad contours of the story are well known, but, but the details are not. Um, so DDT, of course, is a highly debated and highly contested chemical. It's, um, its effect on human, are complex and not still not well uh, well understood, but of course we know that it does have negative effects, in particular on uh, lactation. So on breastfeeding, it passes because DDT accumulates in fat in animal fat, and so it can be passed on through generations uh, between mothers and babies. And of course, it has also really terrible effects on wildlife, especially birds. Uh, Rachel Carson, of course, famously brought about these in the 1970s and, and led to a global ban to DDT. But by that time, like large parts of the globe had already been, been covered in the substance. Um, so Sardinia was really the first place where DDT was tested at a, at a large scale. Um, this is the kind of... Uh, Bo uh, boastful uh, New York Times article, one of the many New York Times articles that were written afterwards. No? Like, and of course, the whole project of getting rid of malaria was, was riveted with uh, all sorts of uh, agendas that uh, had to do with economic development, with imposing, let's say, an idea of economic development on not just on Sardinia, of course, but on the entire Mediterranean. Uh, we have to remember that with the Cold War, Italy was a strategic place for the US. And the US uh, were very present and intervened in Italy's economy and, and politics for, for several decades from the 1950s onwards. Um, so of course the promise of, of uh, eliminating malaria forever was highly appealing to all sorts of actors. Uh, of course, these, the, the kind of advantages that the US could gain from these were on the one hand, for example, like simply be building a market for agricultural uh, machines and agricultural products, pesticides and so on, of course, because the whole idea is that when you 
eliminate malaria, then you can make land productive. Now you can make land usable for cultivation. But also there was an idea of geopolitical control. Um, Sardinia has like a lot of um, international military bases that were built uh, in, from the 1960s onwards. There was a sense of tourist development, of course, so investors from abroad could now flock to this beautiful island and, and start finally kind of like to unleash its potential. Uh, and the last one uh, was to deflate the uh, communist threat of the countryside. Uh, the idea that the countryside had to be managed uh, almost on a global scale by to, to, to fit into US interests, to avoid that peasants could, could, could become a, um, could become a politically active mass. And, and of course, disease control, malaria control was part of this, uh, was one of the many technologies that were deployed to this end. Um, I've done uh, some research in the Rockefeller archives and it's fairly interesting for the kind of like very uh, detailed files that are, that are contained about this project. I, but what stands out really is the way that the whole operation was mediatized. So there was a, Photographer, an English photographer, uh, Wolfgang Suschiski, that was hired by the Rockefeller Foundation and that followed the operations for the two years uh, that I mentioned. Um, and he kind of created uh, like this kind of imagery and these beautifully composed photographs of um, operators um, spraying DDT all over, all over the place. And the Rockefeller Foundation also produced two films that were meant for the public. So there was a kind of like effort to tell, to write this history kind of in real time, no? And a lot of the work that I'm doing is really around this and trying to question this, this sense of uh, construction of, of scientific truth. Uh, today, the kind of accepted reality is that malaria was eradicated by the Americans in Sardinia, um, which is not actually the case. Um, there's the famous uh, Frank Snowden book about malaria in Italy and so it kind of the most complete history of the argument and his conclusion and that of many other scholars is that in fact malaria disappeared for many other reasons um, as a result of um, efforts by the state that had been ongoing for 100 years but somehow you know, the narrative that it was the Americans who solved the, the, the problem of malaria in Italy has stuck um, and it became, it has become common sense and still persists to this day. You know? And I think this, I think tells us a lot about the way that again, like public health intervention become mediatized and, and this mediatization is something that was happening at the same time as the operations were undertaken. Um, so it was also like a product of actually like reconfigure, reconfiguring the landscape. So as in this kind of, I, I find quite stunning sequence of images now, like using dynamite to, to make the water uh, flow. Uh, like the whole point being that, you know, stagnant water, water that doesn't move is poisonous, is something that brings death. And, and so a productive landscape is a landscape in which water keeps circulating. And of course, not just water circulates, but all sorts of other agents circulate. Uh, so now I, I will step back. Actually, I will take a, step, uh, take a step back to almost a century before. So to the moment where Italy was actually a malaria ridden country. And this is something that can be found and mentioned in many accounts uh, by travelers undertaking the grand tour. Uh, so the most famous, of course, malaria area was actually just outside of Rome, the, the, the Pontine marshes uh, were like a kind of coastal flatland that was that was full of malaria. And it, it became like synonymous of like everything that was wrong and everything that was kind of corrupted. Um, I am not going to go into like the details of the history of malaria, the history of miasmas, because it's, it's a very long story. And I, I would assume that perhaps you know a little bit of it. Uh, and in any case, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have time but I wanted to um, highlight the moment when malaria becomes a national emergency uh, in Italy. Um, this is a map that was uh, published in 1882 uh, and it was drawn by an Italian senator, so an Italian member of parliament, uh, who was not a doctor or was not a scientist, he was actually an engineer and he was um, in charge with surveying the status of uh, Italian railways, the construction of the Italian railways. Um, 
And he noticed as he was traveling around the country that the railways uh, were, were, were quite slow to be completed. And that was because workers were, were uh, falling ill or dying with malaria. Um, and this, of course, makes sense if you start to understand the topography of Italy, because Italy is a country that has a uh, it's largely mountainous, it's made of mountain, mountains, it's like a long strip of mountains essentially protruding into the Mediterranean Sea, with a handful of planes or, along the coastlines. And the train lines, the train tracks were built on the coastlines by, by necessity, and these were also the, the areas with, where the most malaria was. Uh, was. Uh, because, of course, uh, the water was running off the mountains and it would accumulate, uh, uh, rainwater would accumulate on the coasts, not being the beaches would duct as, a, as a, something that would prevent water from flowing to the sea. Um, so what is, what is really, think, really striking about this image is, well, of course, it's one of the first earliest maps of, of malaria as a kind of national problem, so at a national scale. And also it's, it's association uh, with, with uh, the construction of railways, so the construction of a national infrastructure. So again, malaria becomes a problem in terms of circulation, uh, in terms of circulation of goods, uh, not in terms of its medical consequences of the, of the on the population. Um, so this is kind of a synthetic image that is created from a combination of like local maps and that were produced and, and gathered by, by the senator. And he would write to the, to the local municipalities to ask them for, the, for a map of malaria in each municipality. And then he kind of like worked to assemble them. So it's also like a huge uh, project of cartographic synchronization. Um, another important development to keep in mind at the time was um, the so-called school of criminal anthropology that was uh, emerging in Italy as a kind of leading voice, scientific voice. Uh, of course, now we know that it's pseudoscience and it was also known at the time, but this did not prevent criminal anthropologists from, from gaining the consensus of, of pretty much everyone. Um, so criminal anthropology was a school that was founded by Cesare Lombroso in Italy, but it had, of course, uh, parallels elsewhere in the West. And it was arguing, it sought to argue that criminality and, and the propension to crime is, is a consequence of uh, your bodily shape, essentially, or your bodily features, and especially your facial features. So they would, uh, Lombroso and his, and his scholars would, would uh, study the skulls of criminals and the, the profiles of criminals to find common traits, no? uh, the traits of the typical, the, the criminal type. What they ended up doing uh, was in fact to um, make, make, make sure that the criminal type would coincide with the Southern Italian type. No? So there was essentially what, what was happening was a rush, racialization of Southern Italians and of Sardinians in particular. So around the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, Sardinians start to be described as natural criminals, huh? people who are born criminals or who have the most probabilities of being born criminals. And so Sardinians start to start to um, take on in the kind of collective imagination of the Italian state the role of criminals, the role of uh, the kind of like the, the least evolved humans, because that was of course the other part of Lombroso's theories, no? that criminals are underdeveloped compared to normal, so-called normal humans. Um, this racialization was of course functional to the project of the national unification of Italy, which was a highly kind of colonial enterprise, so to speak, it's not of course actually colonial, but many of the features uh, of the relationship between the north and the south of the country had somewhat, somewhat colonial connotations for the imbalances, the sheer imbalance of power um, uh, between the capitalist north and a rural south. Um, so now we actually go to the, to the area that I'm interested in, which is the western, the kind of Gulf of Oristan in western Sardinia which is relevant because it's an area that had a lot of uh, coastal uh, marshlands and wetlands. And you can see here around the Gulf, like a constellation of, of ponds and lakes that were fed by, by rainwater. And this was a highly malarial area. 
I'm talking about this particular place uh, because this is the subject of a project for land reclamation, a massive land, massive uh, like area of land reclamation and uh, the construction of a new town that was undertaken during the fascist period. So it's a site really where all of these, um, let's say modern agenda of transforming the landscape starts to really take uh, architectural form. Um, what is important to point out is that malaria in Sardinia was not a natural problem. Huh? Uh, I think somehow the idea that, that malaria is just there, that it's there on the landscape and well, you know, it has been there forever since centuries and centuries. It's still very much, again, the common sense is still very much part of the, of the, of the established narrative no? uh, around, around malaria. But in fact, uh, historical sources of the time reveal that malaria had been getting worse and worse since when, since indeed the unification of Italy. So since the moment when Sardinia was subsumed under the Italian state and the Italian state was a liberal state. So it was a state that sought to expand and um, implement uh, the, an agenda of liberalism, classical liberalism onto the, the entire country. So this of course included the enclosures of common lands, included outlawing uh, common rights uh, and favoring uh, private ownership of the land. It included giving space to private entrepreneurs and, and private concessionaries. And what happened in a place like Sardinia, which was, as I said, quite rural was that um, there was a massive peak of deforestation that followed the, the, its, its, its uh, incorporation in the state because private companies were able to enclose large tracts of forest and, and to then cut the trees down in order to produce coal or to produce wood and timber that could be used for, for commercial purposes. And so this kind of like large scale deforestation um, had a massive uh, set of ecological consequences, most of which are still kind of unaccounted for. It's kind of estimated that throughout the, the 19th century, Sardinia lost two thirds of its forest. Um, one of the consequences was a worsening of malaria because of course forests make sure that the mountains can absorb the rainwaters. If, if you deprive the mountains of forests, the rainwater just flows down uh, to the coast. And this is exactly what happened. So there are multiples, many, many, many um, voices from the period until the end of the 19th, uh, 19th century that, that tell us that this was the case. You know? um, and so this is like one of the many uh, reports that, that, that makes this kind of really striking, really kind of contemporary connection between enclosures, the enclosures of common lands on common forests, deforestation, so for private uh, profits, so capitalist deforestation, and an emergence, and a, or at least like a worsening of uh, epidemics. No? So the idea that, of course, the destruction of nature, the destruction of wild ecologies can breed new, new epidemics. Um, this is the way that the uh, wetlands around the Gulf would look like uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the 20th century, shortly before the reclamation efforts. And again, like these, of course, these kind of images contributed to the racialization of, of, of the Sardinian population, or the idea that people that were living in this kind of conditions and in this kind of ways were um, somehow like underdeveloped, they, they, they weren't modern. No? So it, within a state that was aching to be modern, it was aching to be a European, these kind of things didn't have a place. They had to be. They had to be eliminated. And of course, land reclamation, land drainage, uh, offers precisely this. You now the promise of making uh, all sorts of localized forms of livelihood, localized forms of uh, social organization, uh, turn them into a kind of modern, productive, capitalist agriculture. Um, I think it's also important maybe to bring into the picture someone like Antonio Gramsci because Antonio Gramsci was from Sardinia and he was actually uh, uh, born and grew up precisely in this area on the mountains just uh, up, upland from the 
from the um, from the wetlands. He was one of the most vocal critics of the of the colonial uh, relationship between Sardinia and the and the Italian state. Uh, and for example, in this article, that is one of many, he kind of denounces the, the, the censorship that was enforced by the Italian state that did not allow him or did not allow the socialists and communists to talk about this. So he makes the example, I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, censorship has not allowed us to discuss the political and economical relations between Sardinia and the Italian ruling class that resides in Turin. Why should it be forbidden to Lavanti, which was of course a socialist newspaper, to remind that the directive boards of Sardinian railways and some of the mining companies have their seat in Turin. Why should it be forbidden to remind that Sardinian railways shareholders who gain very generous revenues, let shepherds and peasants travel in cattle wagons, let shepherds and peasants pay exceedingly high fares. Why should it be forbidden to remind that two thirds of Sardinian inhabitants go barefoot in winter and summer? because the price of hides is raised to ominous levels by the protectionist levies that enrich Turinese leather industrialists, one of whom is the president of Turin's Chamber of Commerce. So really, I think it's important, like, I, I think for me, it's been actually quite helpful to, to understand this kind of history in terms of like through the plastic Gramscian category uh, of the subaltern types. Uh, of course, uh, the relationship between Sardinia and the continent, between Sardinia and Italy, between Sardinia and Europe is what gave Gramsci the understanding of the idea of the subaltern, right? And the Sardinians as were seen as the subaltern population in relation to the capitalist power of, of Italy. So I will just very quickly um, outline the, the project, the land reclamation project and go will mainly go through images. And many of these photographs were taken um, by a photographer uh, that I'm working with. We have done several field trips to, to the area and the book that Nida mentioned is going to be a book about this place, particularly from a kind of contemporary perspective, from the perspective of the contemporary ecological conflicts that unfold as a result of uh, this kind of large scale land reclamation and malaria control. Uh, but yeah, for the purpose of our talk, we stay with the, with the historical, as I said, with the historical part. So this is the on, the, on the left side, like a very large dam that was built in 1920. So exactly 100 years ago. Um, and it was the dam that, that created the possibility for the whole uh, project of land reclamation to exist because it, it made it possible to, to build a huge artificial basin on, on the river. It was upland. And so this would, of course, allow for, for the flows of water to be controlled and regulated, and, and of course, then to be used in irrigation, among other things. Um, this is a floor plan of the, of, the, of the whole reclamation project. So you see the kind of imposition of a grid on the landscape, it's a classic kind of modern move uh, to turn the wetlands, which were, of course, a uh, land that was used communally, land that, that was used by the people living in the, in the area for pasture, for hunting, for fishing, turn that into private uh, agricultural land. Um, actually, even the, the pond on, on, on the lake on the top right uh, was drained in a, in a, in a second step. So it, it was uh, about 8,000 8, hectares in total. And I think it's quite interesting to note that the the, the rectangular grid module is exactly the same size of Manhattan's grid for reasons unknown. This is what the freshly reclaimed landscape um, was looking like in the late 1920s. So it's a project that took about 10 years to complete from the 1920 to 1929. And at the center of the, of the new agricultural district, a decision was made to build a, a small town that, that would kind of control and manage the, um, the entire area. And the town was built in a kind of particular, um, seemingly a remarkable, but, but very striking style, which is a sort of like pastiche Northern Italian architecture. And what is, what is relevant about it is that it really shows, I think, uh, intention to create a new imaginary for this place. So, Sardinian architecture wasn't good for this. No, there was like 
a new imaginary had to be imported for, from Northern Italy. Why? Because Northern Italy was a place where capitalist agriculture was already uh, part of the economy, was already, of course, the main source of, of, of economic production. And so this was the model that land reclamation sought to, that through the land reclamation, uh, the state and private entrepreneurs sought to bring into Sardinia, which was the island of shepherds. Um, now, to avoid confusion, this project was not started under fascism. It was started a few years before Mussolini went to power, but it was quickly seized upon by fascism. And so Mussolini made it his project. And the new town was called indeed Mussolini. So this is Mussolini, which was uh, then, whose name was changed. Uh, after the war, of course, because it was no longer acceptable. And it was changing to Arborea. No? That is a name that harks back to a kind of mythical past of Sardinia. So these are contemporary photos of, of, of Arborea slash Mussolini, which is uh, this kind of small rural town that is really striking because, as I said, it has nothing to do with, with the rest of Sardinia. It, it feels like a kind of little fragment of Northern Italy, uh, or in some places, it does feel a little bit like actually suburban uh, US thrown into, into, uh, into a Mediterranean island. Um, so also worth mentioning is the identification between the place and this very large corporation that has been managing the entire agriculture in various ways from the foundation to today. So in the beginning, it, it was owning, it would, the corporation was owning the entire estate now uh, the estate is owned by individual farmers and the corporation acts as a cooperative. No? And it's basically its main output is dairy. It's the, one of the largest dairy producers in Italy. So there is an idea of economic success that, that remains to this day. No? Like this is perceived as one of the most successful places in the whole of Sardinia, which is a fairly poor island with high unemployment and so on. And of course, this kind of conception, right, of, of uh, success, economic success versus the high ecological costs that, that land reclamation had is still something that, that I think we're struggling to come to terms with. I'm just going quickly through the images of the architecture. Here you see some of the kind of more openly rationalist fascist architecture, uh, the buildings that were built in, in the 1930s, that were added in the 1930s. Um, this is probably the most important one of all, which is the Idrovora. So it's a water pump. It's a major water pump that keeps most of these um, plain uh, uh, dry. Huh? So I think it's also worth mentioning that it's a landscape that requires a constant maintenance. No, it, it doesn't stay dry by itself. Uh, if the water pump stopped working, it would, it would be submerged again. It would become wetland all over again. No? So it requires a constant input of energy um, to stay dry. This uh, image of the pastiche, uh, uh, like um, mock northern Italian church with the kind of like lush greenery that that came uh, came about after the land reclamation. Um, going quickly because there's not so much time anymore. But like drawings, architect. These are some of the original architectural drawings of the of the fascist buildings. Um, this is a New York Times article that, that talks about the, um, well, in this case, it's the Roman farm. But, but let's say this is just to say that Mussolini's project of land reclamations and Mussolini instrumentalizing uh, land drainage for, for political and propaganda purposes was actually very much admired abroad. And the New York Times, for example, ran a long series of enthusiastic articles. So, so I think it's important to understand that this is not about fascism, you know? it's about a much longer agenda. Uh, so there is a strong continuity of intents, I think insofar as the landscape of Southern Italy is concerned, that, that begins in the late 18th, 19th century and ends uh, in the 1950s or 60s, if at all. So fascism is really just one, one part of this. No? Mm. So it's also important, uh, to, to think about the people that lived, that went to live in this new, in this new landscape. And they were not Sardinians because Sardinians were not considered to be suited for, for the purpose. Uh, 
this was at least the official narrative. The truth is that Sardinians didn't want to go there because reclaimed land tends to be fairly dry and really hard to cultivate. It's not fertile at all because uh, it's, it's impermeable um, because of course it used to be the bottom of, of lakes and, and wants. Um, so Sardinians didn't want to go there. And so the regime, the fascist regime had to import settlers from Northern Italy. So well, the whole operation was, set in, was put in place to, to bring, to ship basically Northern Italian peasants uh, to Sardinia. And of course, the regime chose the, the poorest peasants, the ones that had nothing to lose. Uh, it was a highly disciplined operation as well. People were screened uh, for their political credentials. They were screened for the composition of their families. So it was a biopolitical operation as well of, of selecting a sort of uh, ideal population that would kind of become a model no, for what the whole of Italy could be. Um, I'm going quite quickly. These are all the documents around uh, the, the, the selection, the process of selecting the, the, the settlers' families. No? So there was a careful calculation that was being made around the composition of the family, how many children, how many uh, male children, how many female children. Of course, like under the fascist idea, there was like a heavily kind of patriarchal uh, connotation to the, to the entire thing. You know? So the, only the men were good for working the land and the role of women was strictly that of staying at home and ensuring the reproduction of, of life. Um, another part of like fascist uh, projects was, was of course the experimentation with uh, new, new, new varieties of wheat. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but just again, to keep in mind that the like connection between um, fertility, femininity and, and grains and let's say the way that these all these ideas were let's say operating at various scales no? um, it's kind of uh, of course celebratory images of of the ideal peasant family you know, that would make this place productive for the regime and then we go back to malaria and i'm done um, because of course at the time that the land was reclaimed uh, malaria had not been yet completely eliminated. Um, so there was a highly disciplinary, uh, uh, let's say, nature to, to the whole, uh, disciplinary connotation to, to the whole thing. Um, the state was issuing um, instructions to the population in order to, to tell them what to do to be protected from malaria. And we can see, for example, in these uh, in these instructions that, for example, one of the things that is written is that peasants were forbidden from being outside, being outdoors in the evenings. Um, so of course, this was built on the fact that that malaria mosquitoes, that Anopheles mos mosquitoes, bite the most during the evening. But you can quickly see how these can can become a very effective tool of disciplining the peasants. No? You forbid the peasants from being outdoors in the evening. You forbid the, the peasants from congregating uh, outside. So basically, you, 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 what you're saying, you know, what you're arguing for is against um, density, against the concentration of people, against any form of socializing, you know? much like social distancing today, uh, which of course was extremely important for the regime because the regime, the fascist regime, had to ensure that the peasants that were staying in this place would not create uh, any kind of political potential eh? by, by talking among themselves, by organizing among themselves, because of course the, the conditions of work were not particularly good. Um, so malaria, like it's really hard to separate, you know, where actual health, public health measures end and where control and discipline uh, on the body of the peasants begin. Of course, uh, mosquito nets being uh, an important part of these. Uh, there are why, like many reports about people don't, that didn't like mosquito nets and didn't want to, to use them because they would reduce the airflow. And so they would make homes even hotter. And so people would use uh, re redeploy mosquito nets that the state was distributing to make tomato sauce. Um, it's of course something that, that we, we see time and again in, in uh, 
contemporary you know, like efforts to control malaria in Africa to the distribution of mosquito net. No? Um, so kind of this just to say that no kind of technical uh, or public health measure, measure is ever neutral or is ever you know, uh, devoid on any kind of um, political ramifications. And I think I will really close it here because I've spoke for probably a little bit too much even. And I think I would like to be keen to have a conversation and to respond to your questions. Maybe I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was amazing. Um, wonderful images and, and the, the story you weave is, is sort of between the images and between these different histories is absolutely fantastic. And you're absolutely right that there is no neutral sort of public health measures. Um, I'd love to open it for questions. I have a ton, but I'd love to open it to others first. Hi, um, I'm Mary Lou Ascot. Hi, uh, I'm so fascinated by the uh, the long um, naming and marginalising of a population through various measures, whether it's a kind of uh, enclosing common land or not permitting movement. I was wondering about the uh, the whole notion of the the racialised criminalization and whether that had any link to any kind of propensity to the disease or whether there was any kind of correlation that was being made to a kind of unhealthy population. I mean, there's, they're kind of suggesting <laughs> the connection is with uh, uh, you know, flawed um, behavior but uh, is there, was there a flawed body as well? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so the, the criminal anthropology school in, in Italy um, did not make, uh, so far as I know at least, a, a parti an explicit link with uh, malaria in particular. Uh, but of course there was a link between criminality and disease that was made more broadly. Uh, or criminality, let's say, and, and health. I would say, because for example, one of the, I will make this example, one of the maps that I found in, in one of the books of, of uh, Lombroso School that I found particularly striking was a map of average heights. Um, so human heights, you know, like bodily heights around Italy um, to show that Sardinians were the shortest population, the shortest people of all. Um, and of course, so they were using then, then Lombroso and the others would use this fact, you know, the, the like reduced height compared to other Italians to argue for, for their, let's say, underdevelopment, you know, for their being a slightly less, um, slightly less uh, uh, evolved as humans. So, so there is that for sure. And also, I mean, the, the idea that I made for myself was that when in the same, exactly the same historical moment, you had this kind of two cartographies circulating you know, around Italy, you know, cartographies of criminality and cartographies of disease, with both cartographies showing the South as the kind of red zone. Uh, then, you know, the connection was, was there in a way, you know, even though it wasn't perhaps even necessary to make it so explicit and it was just there across the, the pathologization of the South was, was then something that, that, that can be found at, at so many levels. Um, I'm going to ask a small follow-up to that. Is there a cartography of productivity as well sort of layered onto this? And I'm wondering if the kind of flawed behavior um, sort of thesis of these uh, criminal anthropology sort of school um, also encompasses an idea of Sardinians as, as, as not productive, not making productive the land. So that's why, in a sense, the settlers, and this is a story that resonates a lot with colonial contexts in Punjab, in, in, in Palestine, in so many places, this idea of the kind of unproductive native. And I'm wondering if that is yeah. also um, 
happening in that discourse. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the unproductive native and also the unproductive landscape. Huh? So it's very, very present so far as landscape is concerned. This idea of unproductivity associated to a certain configuration of the landscape. Uh, because, yeah, as I said, as I mentioned, I, I think a bit too quickly, Sardinia was an island of shepherds mainly. So, so it was largely based on, on, on shepherding and uh, shepherding was relying on communal, uh, again, communal land ownership. So like sets of like, unwritten rules so oral oral uh, regulations that would that would determine the rights of access to pasture around the island and so there was a strong sense that this was not productive no that both shepherding in general but in particular the relying on communal forms of of land use and land control were not of course productive so we can look a century before, so the end of the 18th century, and we start to see the first, you know, kind of treaties of agricultural experts, agronomists, that argue for the introduction of private property, the private property in specifically in Sardinia, but of course in, in, in the rest of Italy. And, and this, of course, is a history that has happened all over Europe and all, all over the world. Huh? But yeah, yeah, there are like, uh, in the, the, the really since the late 18th century, like we start to see arguments in favor of privatizing the land in order to make it productive. And, and as a result, the Sardinian population not being productive enough. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point for sure. Please uh, go ahead and ask your questions. Thank you. Hi, can I ask a question? Please. Yes. Um, I'm Andrea Rudovoy. I teach in the English department. Um, I enjoyed your talk so much and um, I'm really mm -hmm. fascinated by the way in which this, these discourses, uh, you know, you call them cartographies and they are obviously, but they're also discourses at the same time. And the way in which they kind of have a, strategic ambiguity about them. You know, where on the one hand, a very powerful actor like the state can claim to protect and save when in fact it's actually doing all the damage that would require <laughs> protection to begin with. It was hard for me not to think of the current situation and Giorgio Agamben's uh, role and public statements. Um, as you know, I'm sure he's been very critical of the lockdown measures and all of that. And it's been just so paradoxical because you know he's the one of the main proponents of the biopolitical model. And I just can't resist the opportunity to just ask for your comments on that. Thanks. Um... I'm not sure how much I want to wade into the Hangamben debate, let's say, but uh, but I will try. Uh, I think it's it's fair, it's fair enough, and it's it's an important point for sure. And I think, let's say, to to start from this this um, history, actually, the Sardinian um, the malaria, let's say, the history of malaria control in Italy. I think what we see is precisely that. Well, first, malaria was a real problem, right? It was indeed a real problem. Um, that was killing or rendering, let's say disabled thousands of Italians because of course long-term malaria when it's not treated can have a really terrible lifelong effects. Um, but there are two things to that. You know? So one is that, as I said, malaria was not a eternal, a permanent presence of the landscape but it was in itself a consequence of the kind of early phase of liberalism, right? And the kind of consequences of like a liberal economic system onto the landscape. So it was made worse in, in, in to, to say it's very, very simply and very plainly. It was made worse by as, as uh, liberal uh, economical patterns started to, 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 to be more and more um, present around Italy. And this of course was something that was never accounted for. And then in the second, uh, the second point is that the state was not concerned with the health of the population it was not about the health of the peasants. No? So all of the measures to reduce malaria were not directed at improving the health of the people that were suffering from it. They were directed at improving the circulations of goods. So for example, by, by making sure that railways could operate, 
improving the productivity of certain landscapes, such as wetlands and so on, or at, like in the kind of fascist declination, just improving the kind of um, genetics of the population as a whole. You know? So removing disease was a way to kind of make the population more healthy and thus more, I don't know, a better uh, soldiers, for example. You know? So, so I think that's that's these two points for me are the basis for a critique. Um, and maybe like to then to move to the con based on this, what I can say to the contemporary situation is that again, you know, I think we can be we can say uh, many things about lockdowns. We can say many things about restrictions. But but then for me, then it goes back to what kind of uh, agendas are being served, and also to where do certain public health measures come from? You know, which so Agamben I think was was. He, was, he made a lot of mistakes, right? He didn't articulate well at all his arguments and, and that was really part of the, of the problem. And I don't want to, so it's even hard to say whether I agree or disagree with him because it's so poorly, I think, thought out what, what he was trying to say. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think it's about like states of emergency or anything of the sort, but I think when you look at uh, restrictions and measures uh, that were implemented for the coronavirus, for example, in Italy, and I speak of the Italian situation, then you do see like a continuity with, um, with other uh, kind of interventions like state interventions to, to control and discipline uh, that, that had been present or, or a continuity with certain discourses around discipline. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me, that can be the basis for uh, if we want to, to undertake a critique of restrictions, you know, that can be the basis you now to see like how like public health measures then somehow cannot help but being fed, you know, like, or, or just basically evolving from all of these uh, pre-existing discourses around, for example, the way that public space is dangerous uh, or the way that the home is safe, you know? So, and this is the part that I find extremely problematic about COVID restrictions. It's not the fact that whether restrictions work or not. Um, Thank Sorry, you so that was much. A long no, but it was very nuanced. I've been struggling with this myself, and I, I I appreciate the argument from seeing to what extent there are some genealogies here and looking at the details rather than just declaring it the same thing, uh, which it probably isn't. Thank you very much. Any other uh, questions? I will I would like to ask a small question. Uh, I'm from Master of Urban Design in CMU and I'm in Nita's class. So I, I would like to ask, uh, can you talk a bit about the phot photographies of the peasant that were sent not, uh, south, like the woman with the mosquito net, et cetera, like who took those photos and how were those photos uh, circulated? Yes, thanks. Um, no, that's, a, that's a very brilliant, that's a very good question. Um, should I quickly share my screen again, just so that we, we have them in front of us? Um, here. Yeah. So I think you have in mind this photo in particular, which I do find quite striking. Um, I don't know a ton about the history of the images, and I, I must admit, and probably they deserve further investigation. What you do know, these, these images, uh, I got them from the archives of the company that was managing the, um, the entire state of Mussolini. So the entire area that had been reclaimed. As I said before, it was a company that, that was operating in a very kind of particular, like strange way. You know? uh, so it was a private company that had state subsidies and it was the sole owner of the entire, um, agricultural districts and it would kind of subcontract single plots to, to the peasants but under really really strict conditions and the same company was also in charge with building all the buildings uh, building the city with running the city so it was a company town in a way, right but an agricultural company town so this just said this is the, the company's archive and these images were most likely produced for propaganda purposes huh? so they were produced by photographers that were hired by the company to kind of document the, 
successful uh, outcome of their efforts. No? So in this case, it's about uh, two uh, fields that are planted with two different types of wheat uh, to test you know, which one gives the better yields. Because as I said, like the kind of experimentation with wheat varieties was a central part of, of fascist, uh, fascist uh, governance. Um, so this is my, my understanding of them. No? So them being circulated quite openly as propaganda tools. And of course, uh, land reclamations in general, and not just in Sardinia, made up a big chunk of, of the fascist imaginary, the fascist visual imaginary, you know? Because of course, these, these, these photographs of these fields were quite, were quite powerful you know, in conveying a sense of fertility, of productivity, but also a wellness of health, you no? Know? So the health, so, so, Fascism is complex in this regard, but there was a strong current that would identify the countryside as uh, as a healthy place, no? In comparison to the city that was sick, the, the city was a kind of hotbed of disease, and so the countryside was kind of also in a sense racialized, no? The kind of uh, peasants were racialized in this sense as being like the more pure than than urban residents, and of course these had political connotations as well, no? So these kind of images were also meant to say, to argue that uh, you know, this kind of life, this kind of social, social organization is much better than that of cities because cities are harder to control. And cities are places of culture, of politics. Uh, and this is something that fascism I didn't want. So a big part of, of the fascist agenda was that of, of, of um, encouraging a kind of rural imaginary. Yeah? So I think I read these photographs uh, in these optics, but actually these other image is not, is, by the Rock of, is, is uh, in the Rockefeller archives, um, which is the other source that I've been looking at huh? so far as photographs are concerned. And it's interesting because the Rockefeller had a constant presence in Italy from the 1920s. So they would send functionaries, they would send um, they would have like a permanent team basically in Italy because from the 1920s, the Rockefeller was trying to get involved into the, the, the fight to, to control malaria in Italy. And so they would take these photographs as a um, way of documenting their work, as a way of, of documenting the kind of condition of the population. And I found them as I, as I was going through these kind of big photo albums in the Rockefeller archives in, in New York, I, I found them to have a um, very kind of classic ethnological approach uh, with all of the kind of, of course, uh, colonial connotations that this, that this carries. Um, so uh, Sardinians were often portrayed in their traditional costumes. They were often associated with, with very, very kind of like stereotypical roles and so on. So I think this, I, this image is particularly striking for me because it's a documentation of the same place, but through the eyes of the Rockefeller functionaries that were they were visiting uh, right after the war. Um, I, I uh, hopefully is is a decent answer, but I, I as I said I don't know I haven't done too much research and too much thinking about the photos itself. Although I should I, I really should. Thank you. It's very interesting. I have to add that um, some of the photographs from the Rockefeller Foundation archives that I collected from the 1920s with the Rockefeller Foundation um, researchers in India follow exactly the same format. So it's not just that the pictures are sim the same type of image, but also they have been archived in the same exact way. So I, it's super interesting to see these images and to sort of understand how the scope of that project, of course, you know, Rockefeller Foundation is such a global project anyway, yeah. um, but to see that, that the kind of resonance in the material archive is so, so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, there's a striking cohesion no, in the way they, they were working. I mean, the structures mm -hmm. of the project are always the same. The... And over decades. Yeah. So the ones yeah. I have are from 1919, I believe, and they look exactly the same, the same kind of way of displaying them even. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. 
I guess I could ask a follow-up question. Um, I was really actually enamored by how you brought these two, you were talking about these two histories in relation to one another. You started with the DDT in the kind of American project and, or, or, or sort of at least in the narrative, a uh, sort of an American project. Um, and, and then sort of went back to this kind of longer history that ties together, you know, a, a much kind of longer century long sort of project of development, infrastructure, agricultural productivity and, and mosquito and malaria control. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the kind of their intersections of these two histories, um, both as kind of histories of, of malaria control, different technologies, you know, the, the sort of the chemical and the physical, um, but also the kind of different political projects at play. Well, that's, that's a big question. Um, maybe, uh, Yeah, uh, maybe I can I can answer it in this way. Um, so I think in, in Italy there are uh, broadly three phases you know, for uh, for malaria control, uh, and they correspond to three specific technologies. Um, so the first is the use of uh, quinine. So that's that's really kind of the first thing that the state uh, did as a kind of organized intervention. Huh? So in, in the beginning of the 20th century, the very first years of the 20th century, the, state, the Italian state decided to start distributing quinine to, to the population for free. So it kind of monopolized, nationalized the supply of quinine and it, and it started to give it for free to the, to the population. And this was fairly successful, but of course, also riddled with, with problems. The second phase is indeed the deployment of land reclamations. And the third one is, is uh, precisely DDT. So the kind of final solution. So the kind of uh, arrival of this new technology from, from America. And because of course DDT was then used all over Italy, not just in Sardinia. Sardinia was just the test site, let's say. So let me maybe unshare the, uh, the screen. So, so there are these three technologies, no? And I think in relation to political projects, I think it would be tempting to, to try and pin, you know, like a political agenda to each of these three, a different political agenda to each of these three uh, technologies. But um, at the end, you know, for me, what is more interesting are the continuities. Um, that, and then, you know, you start to see the continuities and you start to understand that these technologies are just basically uh, a super, so like a layer that just sits on top of that, no? and the continuity does precisely I think what what you were outlining. So it's like a sense, a general sense of how uh, the landscape should become, like a general sense of what makes for a productive landscape. You know, so a general understanding of uh, certain conditions, namely private property, mm, uh, the role of private capital. Uh, the role of agricultural technologies, uh, the role of irrigated, uh, irrigation. And irrigation is something I didn't really mention, but of course it's central to the story because Sardinia didn't know irrigated agriculture until this project was built, you know, the dam that I showed at a certain point. So again, you know, the, the sense that only through irrigated uh, agriculture uh, would it be possible to, to finally, you know, make uh, Sardinia like an economically strong region. And these priorities are so intertwined with, again, with malaria control that it's hard to, in the, in the records, no, that it's hard to, to disentangle them. Because when you read the kind of like debates that were done in the, in the Italian parliament um, of the period, um, the, 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 the politicians were openly arguing, uh, you know, for, for example, for irrigation as a way to control malaria, you know. So there's a constant like shifting between uh, the idea of like disease control and the idea of like agricultural productivity in the words of the people that were that were in charge in the words of the political elite. So they would openly say, you know, uh, one way to con the best way to control malaria is by introducing private land ownership or by introducing uh, uh, irrigation uh, to agriculture. And so 
And this is why, because of course the state, the Italian state was ruled by uh, an elite that was made largely of landowners, as was the case, of course, in, in most of Europe until the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the, the, that's where capital accumulation, of course, uh, was coming from, and, and that's what made political power. And of course, only people who owned the land could vote in Italy until the 1920s. Huh? So there's that to consider as well. So the, the priorities of the state were, in fact, the priorities of the landowning class. And so malaria control, whether you know, we're talking about quinine or whether we're talking about all these other things, really is for me is almost impossible to disentangle from, from this kind of agenda of, of capitalist um, farming, right? Um, and this is true even for DDT because okay, you can argue that by the 1950s, uh, 1940s, the things were a little different, which they were, fascism was not there anymore, Italy was a republic and so on, but then even then somehow, you know, like the, and in the agenda of, of the US government, of course, was very much a sense like a, a, that the best way was to promote, uh, still to promote, let's say, private initiative in, in agriculture, so with the Green Revolution and so on. And, you know, sorry, it's a bit, conf I, I know it's probably not the most precise uh, answer, right? But it's something I've been struggling with as well myself, you know, kind of where does one story end and the other begin? I can relate to that. To that, I think the kind of some of there's a lot of resonance um, that I see also in in Punjab with, you know, irrigation, eucalyptus trees, gardens, malaria, all of these things becoming very hard to disentangle. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to hear if there's any other questions from anyone or any thoughts about Andrea's work. sort of getting close to the time. Oh, yes. Yeah, um, hi, my name is Shanice. I'm one of the architecture students. I'm also one of Nina's, uh, Nina's students. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the link between um, like the end of your PowerPoint where you were talking about Mussolini and how um, kind of like political agendas were more important than mal mal malaria control and health control. And so the jump between that and then Sardinia becoming like this laboratory for um, DDT usage. And mm -hmm. like, um, I wonder if the same kind of like political agendas were implied when DDT was being used or um, yeah. Or if you can just talk about that transition a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right because it's not a it's it's a phase that I didn't really um, speak about. You know, so so fascism in Italy, um, of course, ends in 1943, and the experimentation with DDT begins in 1946. So it's only two years of difference. Huh? So the transition, in a way, is very. Um, is very short. Uh, one thing to say is that so fascism was really not successful in actually controlling malaria in, in this part of Sardinia, but in general. Uh, so, so malaria was reduced, of course, and it had been uh, kind of declining since the beginning, since, uh, since 1900, for a variety of reasons, uh, including the use of quinine, including the effect that land reclamations in actually have, uh, but, but still malaria was there. And the war made it worse. So there's also this to consider, no? So uh, the war, the Second World War led to kind of a recrudescence of malaria because of course it became harder to maintain the kind of uh, landscape of, of canals and ditches and dikes and, 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 and so there was a spike in malaria cases right after the war. Um, so what happens is like when fascism falls is that um, simply nothing really much changes in this place, no? Because, and that goes back to the question of continuities that was mentioned before. So Mussolini begins before fascism, uh, 
you know, keeps going after fascism, you know, like fascism, you can imagine it as a sort of like something that gets plugged, that plugged itself on top of, of, of these plates. But, but in fact, the way it's structured to this kind of large company that controls the entire everything, you know, the architecture, the lives of the peasants, everything, this one company, this one corporation controls everything. This kind of system, once it's set up in the early 1920s, it is like a thoroughly liberal idea, you know, that has not, nothing to do in particular with fascism. Then even when fascism disappears and goes away, it is still there, you know, so the company remains. So in a sense, there isn't much that changes for, um, for this place. Um, In relation to the Rockefeller Foundation, precisely, and they're kind of choosing Sardinia as a, as a laboratory, you know, as a test site, um, we can think about the fact that this, is not, this was not something that, that was born out of nowhere. Right? It's not that in 1946 or 1945, the Rockefeller Foundation you know, was looking at a map of the world and they said, well, you know, we're going to do it there. But as I said, they had been present in Italy since the 1920s. So the Rockefeller Foundation had been trying to set up like a unit in, in Italy and, and they were actually absorbing knowledge from Italian scientists and scholars eh? because there was a, a lot of uh, scientific production in Italy about malaria control because it was such a big problem. Um, and so the Rockefeller Foundation had been there. So it had been following the situation in Italy. It had been following the debates in Italy. So it had been following the situation on the ground by sending these kind of surveyors around the country and taking photographs and whatnot. Um, and so the kind of, um, again, you see that the two agendas are actually far more convergent than that might look like. No? Of course, fascism was, was using Mara control for its own like propaganda and so on. But as I said before, the, at the end of the day, the point was simply to turn this landscape into something that, that would fit a certain idea of what a productive landscape was. And this idea of productive landscape is quite, was quite similar, eh? whether we are talking about the Italian liberal state, whether we are talking about fascism, or whether we are talking about the Rockefeller Foundation. Eh? So the idea of the productive landscape is a, is a kind of flat, tidy, ordered landscape of fields that are uh, irrigated with, uh, with from like canal and with uh, pesticides and with um, engineered seeds, with, with synthetic pesticides, of course. Um, so yes, there is political change on the surface, uh, but, but this kind of history, I think, allows us to, to kind of trace the things that don't change, you know, like this kind of like broader agenda of modernization, like rural modernization that is far bigger than any of the single element. It's far bigger than fascism and is even bigger than the Rockefeller Foundation itself, I think. Can I, can I ask a question? Hi, um, hi Angelia. My name is Tara. I'm, I, I'm a, a PhD student in history theory um, at Princeton, and I enjoy your talk. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. So I have a question about historiography and um, uh, shall we say agency in history making. I, I wonder about your narrative strategy that you almost like a reverse chronology, like you start from the post-war um, with a very um, intriguing uh, particular and, and a very particular emphasis on DDT, which is not a let's say con not a uh, geographically contextualized agent, but rather a kind of historical agent that work through um, this malaria control problem in an in on an international level. And I was I was thinking about your idea of the continuation of different strategies, what, whether pinine or land reclamation. And if we think about re land reclamation or bonifica, it's a 19th century uh, invention, uh, if, if you will. It's, it's a 19th century uh, land reclamation projects that were coming with, you know, uh, uh, Italian unification, so the Southern question, et cetera, which is highly localized. It's, it's a local water land. It's more local kind of 
agent. So I, I wonder about your historiographical strategy, and I, I wonder if you can elaborate about the way you 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 uh, uh, appropriate and um, uh, and and use of all these agents that or at issue, whether it's a uh, chemical or it's land or it's water or it's mosquito uh, life or non, uh, sorry, human or non-human, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's that, that's it. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Uh, really, really, um, really, really good question. Huh? Um, I, mm, and maybe I find myself a little bit in difficulty here because the truth is that I haven't. Um, so this project is not the result of a scholarly, of a like, uh, let's say, uh, organized scholarly project. And so it's not a PhD, and it's not a, uh, or you know, it might be at some point, and probably will. But uh, it's something that I've done uh, almost. Uh, uh, in a more maybe artistic context. Huh? So the kind of research has, has taken place in a more artistic context. Uh, so in a way I was a lot freer to move uh, as opposed to, to what probably uh, academic uh, conventions would dictate. And this of course also means that my uh, I think assumptions or my, as you say, I think the way I relate to historiography and the way I, I think about historiography is quite loose, no, and and uh, not perhaps uh, very rigorous, and I'm quite conscious of that, and, and sometimes I'm quite worried of that as well. Uh, that there is an element of, of rigor that is missing from from the, from all of these, no. Um, I start to see this as a limit of a project of the project. Huh? It could benefit, I guess, from a for a perhaps a more uh, more serious uh, kind of um, confrontation with some like. Uh, with, lit with certain literature. Uh, that being said, I don't know. I mean, how can I, how can I respond to that? I, I do think that, um, I mean, to, to maybe to go back to your point about DDT being, uh, to, let's say our own context and contextualization, right? Maybe I can start from that. Um, I think all of the agents in this story, right, are are, are, are not contextualized in a way, and, and neither is uh, because also land reclamation is a global strategy, or at least is a European strategy. You know, if you, if you if you think about the fence, uh, the, the English fence uh, that were reclaimed in the 17th century, uh, you, you you read very much the same the same kind of things. No, so you read about the kind of deprivation of uh, livelihood sources for, for the people who were living off the, off the wetlands and what uh, the imposition of private property and so on. So, so for me, I, you know, it's really just a matter of, uh, in terms of my strategy, it's a matter of trying to stay as close as possible to my site to, as a way to deal with this kind of globality to this kind of global nature of 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 this history you know and the, the strategy i found uh, at least was to be as specific as possible uh, I, I i am not able to kind of make claims of, of a more general nature uh, i mean i think they kind of filter of course from the work but but i, I want to resist that and and if i think back of the process of the research process that i that i put in place was uh, constantly about trying to like being more and more precise about my size, no? And for example, choosing Mussolini was not something that I immediately, uh, it was immediately clear to me, but only after, after some time did I realize how actually uh, valuable could it be to, to take only Mussolini or right? to take at least Mussolini as a starting point of the story. No? Um, and again, the use of DDT from this particular place, um, and that's something that I that I that I'm still doing. And as I'm thinking now about the kind of kind of contemporary uh, uh, strands of this story, the kind of contemporary consequence of this story, which again is really not a scholarly thing, because, well, you know, I, I think like for any kind of uh, serious doctoral project, this will be far too much material. You know? In a way, it's far too much material in any case, and I'm struggling with that a lot. 
but I've been wondering, you know, I've been asking myself, you know, what kind of, what are the consequences of all of these, you know, at the end of the day, because this, this is a story that's okay, it might be of his historical interest, but is it of contemporary interest as well? You know, to what extent is it of a contemporary interest? Uh, uh, and so for me, the point was then to start wondering, to start asking myself about what kind of legacies, what kind of traces were left on the landscape. What is the kind of long history of, uh, of, of, of land reclamation? Or in what ways does it impact on the activities, on the livelihoods and in particular, on the kind of contemporary ecological conflicts that, that are in place. Uh, because with land reclamations, I think what is interesting that we know that wetlands are actually super important in, in the fight against climate change. You know? We know this now, and it's like, okay, we discovered this, and after like half of the world wetlands had been drained, you know, in the past centuries. And where does that leave us, you know? Um, so, to go back to historiography, I'm really drawn to all sorts of notions around uh, pre-modern ecological awareness. No? And this is something that I didn't explicitly tackle in the, in the lecture because it would have been too much. And it's also, I'm, I'm still trying to, to, to have like a coherent argument around this. But of course, the, the, the way that the people of this region would conceptualize a web of ecological relations and, and you know, a web of relations between the various agents that we have talked about, land, water, mosquitoes, or parasites, uh, is incredibly important, I think. Because uh, as we say, as, as, as we saw from this kind of short quotation that I was highlighting, you know, there was a very clear understanding that cutting down the forest uh, yield uh, worsening of, of a disease like malaria. Huh? And this is, as I said, it's something so contemporary, you know, it's like we were rediscovering this now, but it's a knowledge that was already there. Just as the knowledge was there that cutting down the trees changes cl the climate. The people knew, the people noticed. Eh? There are records, uh, not many, of course, because it's a whole question on what, what gets recorded and what doesn't, you know, but like kind of like subaltern knowledge often doesn't get archived and doesn't get recorded. But there are traces, you know, that, that reveal how the people of Sardinia, for example, that again, this is true everywhere, would, very, would be very, very well aware that, that cutting down the, the forest and, and closing the forest would, would produce a change in climate on one side and a change in the epidemiological conditions on the other side. So maybe, you know, if I have to think of a kind of historiographical challenge for me would be to kind of incorporate these perspectives you know, around, uh, you know, what makes ecological knowledge at the end of the day. Again, sorry if that's not a direct answer to your question, not what you were expecting. It's great, thank you. Andrea, that was actually really, you know, great. Um, answer because it also sort of helped me think a lot about several strands of, of my work and actually I, have, I was also going to ask you a little bit about the role of the Sardinians and, and their sort of um, sort of some of the indigenous ecolo ecological knowledges and if you've been looking into that so you answered it preemptively. Um, thank you so much Andrea this was really really fantastic and very rich. Um, I think because it's 2.30, a lot of people might have sort of drifted away to their own classes. And um, But I'm really thankful for you for joining us. Um, and, and, and of course, I hope to keep chatting with you more uh, in the future as well. So for those of you who are here, I've put a link to Andrea's work um, down below in the chat. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and engaging. Thank you, Nida, really, for inviting me once again and for the fantastic questions. Huh? It's always the best part. Huh? I would, I would love to just not even give a lecture, but just to get questions. <laughs> they help me so much in, uh, in, in clarifying my work every time. So yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch. Uh, yeah. Of course, Nida, if you want to share my.
if anyone has questions, uh, like they, they, they should be free to write me. So you can share my address, email address, or yeah, just, just collect any, any follow up questions that there might be. I will be happy. I, I will. Yes, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great. Great. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone.